Good morning everybody and welcome to this fifth edition of the National PhD Welcome Day. My name is Thomas Castinius and I'm the CEO for LIST, but I really want to welcome you on behalf of all the research actors here in Luxembourg. So this event is a joint event organized by LIST together with University of Luxembourg, LISER, LIH, Max Planck Institute, LAXDOC, DSAIL, URAXES and FNR. So this is a special event, this is a special year, and because of the COVID-19 pandemic we had to do a different event this year. So the aim of this event is to inform you about the Luxembourg research environment in general, and also to show you what is offered to you as a PhD candidate in terms of training and support for example. Also to get in contact with the key actors in doctoral research education and get some information from some of the more senior PhD which you have around you and simply to become part of the PhD community. I also want to take an opportunity to talk about what does a PhD mean and what did it mean for me personally. So it's true I did a PhD, it's a long time ago now, uh, but my PhD has really made a difference for me personally in my life and in my career. And when I think around it, maybe there are four things that come to mind. The first thing is that a PhD is something that opens a lot of doors. It opens doors in research, in academia, but also in industry and anything in between. It's simply a very good way to start a career. The second point is that a PhD is a research education and what you will learn is a scientific approach. You will work on a topic and you're going to apply a scientific approach. In your career, most likely your topic will change, but your scientific methodology, your scientific approach will remain. And this is your most valuable asset to be able to attack new problems with a scientific approach. And I also recommend you to go really deep. This is an opportunity in life to become really an expert on a topic, to go very deep and become world leading in your field of research. But at the same time, stay curious and take the opportunity to understand other disciplines. Because what you will experience is that by talking to other researchers, to other disciplines, a lot of ideas comes up and a lot of innovation actually takes place in the boundaries between disciplines. And the last thing I want to mention, also a bit out of my personal experience, is that if something goes wrong, and something will go wrong, that's the art of research and innovation, there are many helping hands here to help you. Sometimes doing a PhD can feel a bit isolated, lonesome, that's a part of, that's going very deep, but there are many, many helping hands here to help you if something goes wrong on your science, on your research, with your supervision, or whatever it might be. And don't hesitate to reach out. You can, will find help. We are here to help you. We're here to make your PhD a success for you and for the research community as such. And I also want to take the opportunity to say that I congratulate you to do your PhD in Luxembourg. It's a very good moment in time to do this. Luxembourg is a rather young innovation ecosystem, and that means that we, there's a lot of opportunity to challenge, to uh, influence and change this innovation ecosystem. As you may know, our tagline in this country is let's make it happen. And we really take it seriously in research. Let's make it happen and don't hesitate to take an idea and an initiative to make something happen. Here it can really happen. So I want to welcome you to your journey. Our journey together has started and we will go far and we will go together. And I really want to welcome you and enjoy your day here. And with that said, I have the pleasure to hand over to the moderator for today, Baisha. Hi everyone, I'm Baisha. I will be your host for this virtual event session. So, let's go. Hi everyone, welcome to this virtual event. As you may have noticed, we had a little technical problem, but that's okay now. So this event is totally dedicated to you. And due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the design of this event has changed a little bit. This event is now totally virtual, even for this game, for the game of the afternoon. So we will talk about it later. Concerning the toolkits, transferable skills, doctoral candidates association, your access, well-being, and also the incubator of the University of Luxembourg, we will organize a two-hour virtual event in November 
you will receive an invitation in a few days. In order to connect with your peers and your community here at Luxembourg, we had created a hashtag. This one, Dr. Allux. This hashtag is not only dedicated to this event, but to you and your journey as a doctoral candidate here in Luxembourg. So it's up to you to make it a success and a trending topic. So let's say, let's go. We will start this testing, we will start, sorry, with the testimonials of doctoral candidates from different research fields. First, they will introduce themselves, five minutes. And then we will have a 10 minute Q&A session. You can drop your question here in the chat during their presentation. So let's go. And I have the pleasure to introduce you, Edita from LIST. Hello. Hi, Edita. Also, we have Gary from Lizer. Hi, Hello. Gary. Still Hi. in your kitchen. Still in my kitchen. Everything's in the kitchen. <laughs> Jessica from the University of Luxembourg. Hello. Hi, Jessica. And then Yolanda from the LIH. Hi, Yolanda. Thank you for being with us today and for sharing your experience with us. So I will let the mic to Edita to start and then you could pass it to each other. So let's go for the five minute presentations. Okay, hello everybody. Um, or oh, Moyen, how we are saying in Luxembourg. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Okay, good. Um, so my name is Edita, I come from Poland and I'm doing my PhD at um, Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. So my background is in chemistry, exactly in polymer science. So I did my master thesis in Switzerland and then I work a little bit in the industry. And then I ask myself a question, what actually I want to do? It, do I want to go more in the industry or um, shall I um, do, go to academia? And then I was looking for possibilities. And it happened that I come across the advertisement of the PhD position at least. So I thought, okay, why not just pack a car and just go to Luxembourg and start a PhD? So um, at the beginning, my project supposed to be about absolutely something different that I'm doing now. But this is what is normal that we have to really adapt to our project and really um, keep our eyes open and think what are the other possibilities. Um, so right now I'm working with a plasma polymers, um, which when I heard about this first time, I was absolutely stunned. What is plasma? What is, um, what is this bill? I have no idea. Um, but as our CEO said, um, there's many people who are really open to talk. If you only ask the question, they will always explain everything to you or pass you any, um, uh, references. Um, so it's really nice and really open environment. Um, so, well, um, in case of uh, moving here to Luxembourg, um, when I think about all this journey, um, I have to say that here it's really um, young university and this um, whole environment, I will, as it was said before, and um, what is the funny story is that when I moved to Luxembourg and I sent to um, the address to my parents where I'm going to live in Belval, they tried to um, check where I'm going to live in, um, in, in which um, a place from university. And believe me or not, but there is still not updated the Google Maps. So my parents were pretty sure that I'm living in the, in the, on the building site. Um, so you can see that everything is still um, adjusting, everything is still built, but you can be part of this building process and um, of this young university of, um, of all the uh, research centers. As well, it's a really amazing um, international environment here. So you can really make friends from all over the world. Uh, you can improve your languages, starting with English, but then I'm pretty sure you can find native speakers in every possible language um, in here. Um, well, this is me. So then um, I will pass the mic to Gary, I would say. Thanks very much, Edita. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great stuff, okay. 
Uh, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Gary Robinson, I'm from Ireland and I'm in my fourth year of a PhD in Economic Geography at the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research, also known as LISER or LISER, people call it different things. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my background first and then I'll talk a bit about the PhD topic and the research field and the reasons for choosing it and then a little bit about Luxembourg as a research environment. So uh, the PhD can be all consuming, especially as you get closer to the end and you realize how much work needs to be done in a short time. Uh, but I did actually have a past life before doing the PhD. So I did a BA in languages and business in Dublin and Ireland and after that I had quite a long career in IT uh, also in Dublin. And I just kind of fell into that despite never studying IT but uh, it kind of came in handy when it later when it came to choosing a PhD topic. Um, so around 2008, I, I lost my job. I was made redundant with a lot of other people. Uh, took a year out, traveled around South America and Asia, uh, then worked as an English teacher. And then I moved to the UK and uh, I did a master's in political economy at the University of Sussex. Um, I realized then I really liked going back to education after quite a long gap, um, but I wasn't quite ready to do a PhD right then and there. So uh, I went to Korea, South Korea for a year to teach English, ended up staying for four years, came back, got a job working at a university in the UK, but I realized that I missed studying and learning and researching. Uh, and then I saw a PhD position advertised here in Luxembourg. So I applied and I was lucky enough to be accepted for that. So as I said, I'm employed at Leaser, um, but I'm enrolled as a student at the university here. And I'm also enrolled at the Ghent University in Belgium. So that means my PhD is a coach hotel or a, a joint diploma between those two institutions. Uh, as for the topic, my research is on technological change in finance, specifically on international payments or how money moves around the world. Uh, there's a lot of change happening in this area with things like blockchain and cryptocurrencies and fintech. Um, but there's a lot of other change too. Uh, my research is qualitative, so not quantitative. And that means I've been conducting semi-structured interviews with people who work in the area to try and find out more about the change that is happening. Um, for qualitative research, COVID presents uh, a challenge because you can't really travel anymore to go and interview people. Now, I was lucky enough that I, I did most of my interviews, but I found people quite accommodating and wanting to do online interviews as well. So uh, I can't say I got into researching the topic because I'm passionate about payments or finance. It's more I got interested in it after the financial crisis of 2008. And a lot of people lost their jobs and I thought finance seemed very powerful and very complicated so I wanted to learn more about it. Um, as for why a geographer is doing research on finance, well economic geography is concerned about what kinds of economic activity happen and in what places and why they happen in some places and not in others and it's concerned with connections and flows between places. So my research is more accurately financial geography, it's a, a subfield of economic geography. Um, despite its small size, Luxembourg is quite an important financial centre globally. So it's an interesting place for this kind of research. And my PhD topic is part of a larger project looking at international financial centres like Luxembourg. So I'm here now in Belval, which is where I live and where I work. And I can't deny that moving to Belval was a bit of a shock after living in a busy city like Seoul for a few years. But there's lots of advantages as well. So uh, when I was living in Seoul, I used to spend about three hours a day traveling to and from work. But here I can walk in about 15 minutes, walk there and back, or at least before COVID, because now I'm working from home a lot. Um, so you've noticed that Belleval is very small and it's a work in progress, but it's got an awful lot within a short distance. Pretty much everything you need is here. And as Eddie just said, it's a, a very good way to form a community with all the other students who live around here as well. Um, I would say as well that Luxembourg has invested a lot in setting up a good environment for research. And in my experience, both Leeser and the university um, have been really good research environments and very supportive settings as well, if you have any problems. Uh, I'd say also that they've handled the, the difficult COVID situation um, very well too. So if anyone has any questions about living in Belleval or about qualitative research or about my research field or topic, or if you have any questions about returning to do a PhD after having worked for a long time or anything else, then uh, feel free to get in touch. And I'll pass the mic over now to uh, Jessica, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? 
Great, thank you. So I'm Jessica. I'm originally from Luxembourg, um, but I studied psychology in Germany. Um, and then I decided to return to Luxembourg because of the, among others, the special language situation. So actually I'm doing my PhD in educational psychology in the domain of linguistic diversity in students. And as was already said in the video before, the working with other people from other disciplines can be very enriching because my PhD is situated in an interdisciplinary research project where we are 11 PhDs from different backgrounds. So there are other psychologists, but also, for example, linguists or pedagogical um, experts. So my PhD project itself focuses on um, me methods for measuring school effectiveness. So it's on the border between psychology, education and statistics. And for me, I really, really like um, being in between those different fields because for me, it was always that I'm interested in many different things. And this is also what can be very enriching in your PhD. On the one hand, you can focus on one very specific thing, but on the other hand, you can still get insights into many different other interesting projects. And what is actually interesting um, about my pathway is that from the beginning, I said, I want to work with people. I do not want to sit at a desk the entire day. I really want to be interactive and do something. And then during the studies, I realized that research is actually also really, really interesting, which is why I then decided to conduct a PhD. And maybe also um, not interesting, but still good to know, I submitted my thesis last week. So now I'm actually really relieved and was quite a stressful time before, I think you can imagine. But now I'm very happy to have submitted and I'm preparing my defense and also really looking forward to the ex exchange, even though because of COVID it will be a bit different because also some jury members will have to join online because they are not allowed to travel to Luxembourg. But as Gary already said, I think the university has handled the situation very well so far. Yeah, so I think um, as Gary also said, if you have any questions about me, about conducting a PhD in psychology at the University of Luxembourg or any other questions, feel free to ask them now or also contact me later and I will pass the mic to Yolanda. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Yes, uh, my name is Yolanda and currently I'm in my fourth year of PhD in LIH, Luxembourg Institute of Health. Um, and to just to tell you about, about a bit about myself, um, I was born in Andorra. It's a small country between Spain and France. And at the time I was exposed to three different languages. I was speaking Portuguese at home, uh, French at school and Spanish on the streets. And you might think, oh my God, quite challenging. And guess what? Later on, it, it became useful because in Luxembourg, as my colleagues already mentioned, is very international. So I get to talk three languages per day, which is unbelievable. And I particularly like, and that's the richness of doing a research in Luxembourg. You get to know different people with different backgrounds, different cultures. You always learn a lot with everybody you interact. So I would say networking, it's really, really important to establish a uh, relationships with people, also to know what the others are doing, because like this, we'll have different views, different perspectives that you can be useful for your even uh, research project. So op be open, uh, listen to uh, what people are talking and saying to you, and you might find something interesting that you never think about it. And then you will consider that, oh, okay, that's really cool. Let's do some research because this is what we, we do. We are scientists, we are curious. So do it uh, for you as a person, also for your uh, work. Um, and how I arrived to Luxembourg was pretty funny because um, I was really passionate about immunology and neuroscience where I did my previous studies. And then I wanted, on top of that, I wanted to have an international uh, experience. So then I was applying and then I found an interesting project in Luxembourg where I could combine uh, both and uh, brain tumor on top and specifically uh, the project is to focus on uh, immune cells in the brain and how they adapt in the tumor context and it's quite challenged because it's like three main topics in one and again you have to be open you have to know different um, fields and then to put everything together and into perspective 
Um, and what I also want to say, it's very important that you have um, a good relationship or um, support from your team and supervisor. Uh, not only you can have also a lot of support from your colleagues and you should talk with your colleagues and express and ask for help because we are here for that. We are a community that we support each other. If you don't know where to go, ask. Uh, there is special uh, people uh, that have this responsibility. Uh, sometimes it's not easy to talk with your supervisor, then go to someone and ask. In each institute, I'm sure there is uh, people responsible for that. Uh, and the most important is uh, keep going. It's there are days uh, that um, it's pretty hard because sometimes you are alone, um, like it was said in the beginning, uh, don't give up because later on you will be super proud of yourself. Uh, it's tough, but again, ask for help. You have your colleagues and you have a life beyond the lab. Uh, you know, you are a person, you are unique, you have your hobbies focus on this, develop other skills, you know, be open. And like this, you will have a better vision um, of what you are doing and also as a person where you want to go, because this is really important. Now you start your PhD, but you should already think, you know, okay, where I am, where I want to go, what I need to build as a skill, uh, you know, to succeed in your uh, current job. And also as a person, what do you want to achieve, you know? cultivate your mindset. There are plenty of good courses in, uh, provided by the doctor school, uh, the transferable skills, and they are very useful. You should do already in the beginning, your first year where you have a bit more free time and dedicate to, to these courses, get to know with uh, your colleagues, your teachers, and start to build your own network. And if you have also some questions or you don't know where to go, or you can always drop us an email um and yeah i i think it's all i wanted to share um thank you <laughs> thank you very much yolanda thank you all so now let's see if we have some questions i don't see any question here but i have some questions so the, the I would like to ask you, um, how often did you uh, discuss your project with your supervisor, with your supervisor to see the progress of it? Gary? So uh, I work, I'm, my PhD is not a project that I submitted myself. It's, um, I was kind of hired to work on, a, on a, another project and I came up with a PhD within that. So that means my supervisor is quite heavily invested in what I'm doing. And because these are is it's not huge, it's all just on one floor of a building, like we see each other pretty much every week. Um, and we, we, we can meet, we could have formal meetings, we could schedule them like every week or a couple of weeks, or we could meet even more often if we're working on something, um, like kind of getting close to submission of something. So it can change. I think it depends on what you're working on, uh, also maybe what phase of your research you're at as well. But also the relationship that you have with uh, with your supervisor as well. Um, it's going to be different for every project and every person too. Okay, thank you. I see we have another question. What was the best experience so far? You didn't have a, a best experience? None of you? <laughs> I will say something good. Okay. Uh, the feeling yeah. you get when you when you submit uh, a paper is a, a pretty good feeling. Um, it doesn't feel so good when your paper gets rejected, but it feels really good when you submit it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. You have something? Yes, I actually I agree. But what I really enjoyed was the possibility to go to conferences and network with other people from your field. And this is something I really appreciate that at the University of Luxembourg, you actually get the possibility to travel to conferences and um, maybe not during the COVID times, but probably it will also be possible soon again. And that's something I really appreciate. OK, thank you. We have another question from Sarah Montero saying, looking back, if you had to change some aspects of the way you've done your work, what should you change? 
I can answer that one. Okay, Yolanda. Yes. Um, but personally, I think, like I said, it should be very clear from the beginning what you want to do. So when I started, it was uh, okay. I had like a big um, project, maybe aims that we wanted to address, but it was not very specified what I had to do. So it's normal that in the beginning we might feel a bit lost because most of the time it's a different background. You have to read, and I had not the courage to go to my supervisor and ask more often. Look, um, I don't understand this, or I'm a bit lost. So I wanted to solve by myself. Um, but sometimes, um, yeah, you also have to ask for help. So for me, what I could advise is in, in the beginning, it's normal, but don't be lost too long because otherwise it will take, it will take longer um, and it will, be not, it will be very stressful later on because you have deadlines you have to publish uh, ideally before or more or less yeah, when you are finishing and depends of the field. Uh, sometimes can take very long experiments. Um, so this is what yeah I could recommend already from the beginning. Have a clear plan. Ask, ask, and ask. Don't be lost or don't start to question yourself because it's a learning process. There are many things that we don't know, and most of the time it's during your PhD that you get to know different niches that you might be interested. So be curious and ask. That would be my advice. Hey. Thank you, Yolanda. We have another question from Rajan Buyan, sorry. For a cumulative, cumulative, cumulative PhD, how many papers you guys had to publish in high quality journals? Um, Rajan, let's go I? for Edita. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, it's, um, really early now to think about this because most of um, like your thesis will really clarify I think around um, end of your uh, end of your PhD so now you might know what you're doing but then it everything can change so you don't have to really push towards this cumulative thesis and of course it's really important your um, CET committee so at the University of Luxembourg, we have uh, yearly meetings, annual meetings with all your supervisors, and you'll be showing your progress of work. Um, what have you done till now? What is your research question? Did you answer this research question? Um, what is still missing? So sometimes um, those people can have, um, I mean, those people will have um, a main opinion, and then they will tell you if they agree with such a cumulative thesis or you should write a book from um, your side. So it's um, it's all the time discussion between exactly this committee, your supervisor. Um, so you have to keep your eyes open and ha have the clear vision of your story because story is the most important. You have to tell the story in your, in your PhD thesis by the end. Okay. Thank you, Edita. Yari? Yeah, so my PhD is definitely by publication and I have to do four publications and the uh, the specification for where they need to be published, like the standard of journal, I think that was agreed upon by the funders who funded the program and they said it needed to be journals in, they have to be listed in web of science, which is pretty broad. It doesn't mean that they're like the top of the top, right? Um, but there's also some, it, I think it's not exactly clear whether they need to be just submitted, um, whether they need to be accepted or whether they need to be already published. And also there, you, there might need to be, you might need to figure out how many of them can be co-authored, how many you need to be first author on and how many need to be sole authored. So there's some differences in this and I think you need to work it out with your supervisor, but it may also need depend on the funders and what is agreed with whoever funds the, the project. Thank you, Gary. We have a very interesting question from Prasad Adav. How to manage the expectations of your thesis guide? <laughs> Carrie? Uh, sorry, it <laughs> just, uh, just occurred to me that there is a transferable skills course called Managing Your Relationship with Your Thesis. Model. Exactly. So do that course. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so do that transferable skills course. Um, do you have another clear question? 
Yes, Yolanda? If I can add to the previous uh, question, I would say uh, expectations can change as long we are honest to ourselves and we can clearly say to our supervisor, look, I know that you expect this from me, but in fact, I like I lack this knowledge or I need you to help me with something. Then you can work together towards uh, an expectation. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. And if you think your supervisor is asking too much from you, also be honest with him and say, look, uh, I understand, but let's try to, you know, to reach something common because maybe I need help to achieve this expectation because otherwise both sides will be frustrated, let's say, and it's totally not worthy and that's not the aim of doing a PhD. So it's important to have a clear communication and really mm -hmm. express uh, if we have some problems or limitations, please talk with your supervisor and work together because it will be much better uh, for both. Thank you, Yolanda. We have another question from Emmanuel Rodriguez saying, would you like to stay in Luxembourg after your PhD? And will you stay in research? Yes, Jessica? I think maybe for me it's different than for the others because I am originally from Luxembourg, so I really want to stay. Um, and I will also stay for one more year of postdoc because um, we applied for um, a grant continuing what I started. So that's something that you might also want to think about already in your third year, maybe. Like, can your project be continued and would you want to ask funders for money to um, guarantee your postdoc position? Thank you, Jessica. Uh, we have another question from Elisa Gomez de Lope. Did anyone do an internship or secondment in other institution? If so, how did you do it? And was it planned from was it planned, sorry, from the beginning? Edita? Um, I, if I understand what um well, it's um, the internship while doing a PhD, so like um, a visiting stay in other institute. Um, yeah. So, well, okay. it was planned for me, but as the current given situation, I'm not able to do it. Um, so it was because of networking um, and because of uh, actually my supervisor and um, that we could find a place um, where people are doing the measurements similar, I mean, what we are um, lacking. So we cannot perform um, such a measurement right now here because this is the method developed in the certain institute in the other place in the world, thanks to networking. Um, I could be able to go and, and perform such measurements, but due to the situation, I couldn't um, do so right now. So this is the possibility, just networking, talking, asking. Um, I'm pretty sure if you come to your supervisor with an idea that you found this method that might be a complementary method to what you are doing here, or you can um, try to do something with your colleague from other university, or maybe you can collaborate with your home um, university from your, um, from your country or where you used to stay before. I think everything is possible. You just have to, as was said before, ask, ask, and once again, ask for it. Thank you, Edita. I have another question. How was the first month of your research and how challenging was it? Gary. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna combine this. There was a, another question at the top of the list. What was the most difficult for you when moving to yeah. Luxembourg? starting your piece. So I'm going to combine those two and I would say I moved to Luxembourg in an, in August and I moved to Belval in August and it was the worst time to move because the whole country is on holidays and yeah. uh, it was dead. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that was hard I would say but uh, also then when I started in Leeser there was not many other PhDs. There's now a, a, a good community of PhDs there so, so that was difficult. So um, there's a couple of things. It's one, it can be difficult to find your feet in a completely new research field and you have to in one way get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, you're not supposed to know exactly what you're doing at the beginning. Nobody expects you to know what you're doing. So I think people will be quite forgiving of the fact that you're new and you're in a new country, you're doing a new research, everything is new. So 
um, people will be very forgiven of that. And, you know, they're all other academics and they've all gone through the same thing, basically. Um, so that's the research side of it. For the more social side, um, it, it's, it's COVID time. It's very, it's not very easy to go meeting people to socialize with. But uh, if you're, if you haven't met people yet, there's a Lookstock, there's a society for, uh, for postgraduate students. Um, if you live in the student accommodation in Belval, in Unival 1, there's a WhatsApp group on the door that maybe you could join that group and see if anyone wants to go for food while the restaurants are still open. Um, or just to hang out outside in a socially distant, unresponsible manner. Um, so yeah, there's a, a kind of a, a number of things that you, that you can think of, but try to uh, go easy on yourself. It's normal to feel like you don't know what the hell is going on. It took me about a year to feel like I was connecting dots between things I was reading. But like Yolanda said earlier, keep going and it, things will get clearer as you go on. And you, there's people around you that ask for help. Sorry, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Um, we have another question from Anne-Marie Hanf saying, when you think back to your PhD, what would you do exactly the same again? Yes, Yolanda? Um, so I've always been uh, passionate about what I do. And even the crisis moments in the lab, uh, the most important is to keep, keep going, still motivated. There are things that doesn't work. It's normal. Most of the time it doesn't work. But still, you know, you have a clear goal. You want to do this to prove something. So you keep doing experiments. You find alternatives to to prove. So don't give up. And personally, of course, this depends on the research field. Uh, but in biology, you keep doing experiments. You still always have a question that you want to answer. If it's not B, it will be maybe C or D. But keep going um, and think why you started your PhD. Because sometimes uh, we wonder and we might not see the light in the darkness. <laughs> but ask yourself, OK, why I'm, why I'm doing this? Why I started? Ah, OK, this is the aim. So OK, keep going. Um, yeah, and you will see how to say it's like in life, there is always up and downs, but then if you keep going, you will reach there. Uh, but if you give up, then yeah, you will miss a great opportunity because later on it will be useful. You just you, It's like you have to change perspective of, uh, or what, what you are doing and how can you use in your favor. And um, yeah. Thank you very much, Yolanda. I have a very interesting question from Laure Poli saying, do you have good advice for the first CET? Yes, Edita. Um, don't push too much on um, results to see, to, to show that um, you really um, gather a lot of data during this time. Um, I think um, it's really important that you show that you understand the state of the art of the of your research field and the most important that you have clear research question because um, I think this is um, what um, um, CEO uh, at the beginning of uh, presentation um, said that it's not about even the the research the the results but it's about your scientific approach so I think this first CT is to show that you already um, have this scientific approach, that you uh, clearly can identify the gap uh, where your PhD will fit and eventually show some results that you already um, understand what you're doing. But just this clear, that the statement that you clearly understand what you are going to do, what is missing and what is your research question for um, your next years. Uh, maybe I can add, um, because I really agree what you said, but I think it's also really important to use the opportunity um, to plan your PhD. So what for me was always really helpful to have a timeline of what I did so far and what I still want to do. Um, so this is something that can also be really useful to discuss it with your CET because they are just more experienced in planning projects and what should be done at which time point. Yes. 
Thank you, Jessica. Um, I have something from Blandine Lando. I think it's more like a statement and it's a reference again to the transferable skills course of the university, our partner. You should be happy. Uh, in case of co-funding work, the course goods research practice can help you find ethical legal solution to limit the interferences. That's a statement. You agree? Did you follow this course? No. Good research practice. You must have. Yes, it's mandatory. <laughs> it's <You have> mandatory. <laughs> you have to do it. So you did it. Yes, yes. And uh, I highly recommend to do it in the beginning of your uh, PhD. I did more towards the end because it's highly um, booked. This course, so you really have to 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 be to register uh, early. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting because uh, I work with uh, live animals, so it's really important to know the ethical rules on your country and also in Europe because we we follow a specific guidelines. So you have to be aware of, of this. You have to respect. And again, when you publish, you have to state the guidelines that you use for your uh, in vivo work, if it's the case. Then it was also interesting to know more about the culture, the environment that we can create in the lab, how we can support uh, each other. Um, so yeah, uh, it's really interesting. So I don't know if someone wants to add something else, but yeah. Yeah, Edita. Um, I learned on this course as well um, that at University of Luxembourg exists somebody, um, now I probably I would just missay it, ombudsperson, is the person that you can, con you can contact this person if you want somebody uh, neutral in case you have any conflict or any problem at your work environment. So um, if, if it's your supervisor or anybody um, in your close neighborhood and you need this neutral person from outside of, um, of this conflict. In case for the future, I think it's very important to know because it might happen that you might have some disagreements and you might need somebody neutral like this um, to help you um, to solve the problem. So um, I think that was um, for me, interesting to know from this course because I was not aware of existence of this person at all before. Okay, and I just um, have a message from Anya. She will have a presentation just after you, saying that she could uh, give some information about the ambush person in her presentation too. So we will talk about it later too. Uh, we will take just two questions again. I have. Uh, I have one from Tariq Kamo. Um, oh, that's a tr tricky one. How do you cope with doing literature research turning out being useless? For me, it feels like wasting time. Yes, Gary? So much to say about so many things. Uh, I, I can kind of empathize because I was in the first year of my PhD, you know, I had the first six to nine months, you're finding out about the field, doing a lot of reading. And a lot of it, you don't come back to when you go, oh, that was nonsense. But some of it, some of it, you end up making connections to other things. Just because it doesn't feel exactly relevant right now, doesn't mean that in the future you can't kind of draw on it. Um, it okay, it may never be connected to what you do. But I, I don't think it's ever useless to go and read a whole load of other literature, um, especially if it's not directly related to what you're doing. I think it's good to be able to, to join dots between different fields and different topics. Um, and another thing I would say about, think about this is more generally about challenges of researching. Um, so I had a lot of some problems doing field work, getting access to interviewees. I planned to do 100 interviews, and it turns out that people in finance are quite secretive and they don't want to talk to you. Um, <laughs> That's that's a problem, but uh, I ended up writing a methodology paper, kind of talking about what I did about these problems to try and address problems. So it's more if you think about challenges that you encounter in research, you learn from them, but you can also sometimes try and use them to your advantage. 
And I'm not saying you can write a paper about everything that goes wrong, unfortunately. But uh, but yeah, just because something feels useless or difficult right now doesn't mean it's not going to be useful sometime in the future. Thank you, Gary. And we'll have our last questions. Uh, oh, from Matthias Klee. Along the way of your doctoral studies, did you come across research filling the gap you wanted to fill? Yes, Jessica? Yes, I was actually already writing the first paper when I realized that in the same year someone else had done something very similar. Um, and in the first moment, it's really, really frustrating. <laughs> so uh, what I did is I went to talk to my supervisor about it and he was actually able to see more neutral on it. And then he was like, okay, so what did they do? And what did we do differently? And then you just have to find out what you did differently to what already exists. And you can still fill gaps that they have not filled. So there's no one who will do exactly the same as you did. And then you just have to focus on something else. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. I think Gary has something to say. Hi again. Uh, yeah, this happened to me last Friday, actually. And it's uh, when you find a paper, you've just written a paper, I was ready to submit it, and I was getting feedback on my supervisors. And then I found this other paper from like six months ago, and I knew the person who'd written it, and I was going, how did I miss this paper? And I read it, and it was like someone punched me in the stomach, because like, God, <laughs> it was so similar. But it turned out, the more when you read it again more in depth, you find, okay, they do say these things, and I'm going to have to cite them, and I want to cite them because what they've said is useful, but I don't look at it in exactly the same way that they look at it. I look at it in a slightly different way. And you can kind of think of it like not as competition, but more like everybody is kind of trying to build knowledge in a certain field, and everyone's doing it in a slightly different way. So you kind of build on what other people do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, but yeah, it's frustrating, no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all this inside input. I just want to let you know that we have more than uh, 85 people connected. So 85 people who have heard what you're saying and your advice. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, I just want to say to the audience that if they may have other questions, they could contact you on the landing page of this event. There is your LinkedIn link and they could contact you uh, directly via this link. So thank you very much, Guy. Have a nice day. Thanks again. Bye to you. So now I will welcome Anya from the Office of the Doctoral Studies of the University of Luxembourg. Hello, Anya. Hello. <laughs> So Anya will present you some general guidelines regarding the key elements of your PhD life cycle at the University of Luxembourg. So I will let the virtual flow to Anya. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and I'm sorry for the strange light in my office. It's, it look, I look very yellow, but uh, uh, that's only the, the light, I think. Um, I've prepared some slides and uh, I think the colleague from the uh, list is launching the slides now. In the meantime, uh, I can already present myself. I'm the head of the Office of Doctoral uh, Studies here at the University of Luxembourg. Uh, so uh, my team and myself, we're handling all the ad administrative uh, steps of your life cycle <laughs> here at our university. Um, so, uh, uh, this uh, comparing to what we just heard, and I really wanted to thank the, the four panelists, that was really great. It was really, really nice to have this practical uh, feedback um, from, uh, from you. So, my topics will be a bit drier, so, uh, but, but I hope it will, it will, however, make sense to you. So, uh, yes, so, um, Oops, can we go from the beginning? Yeah, this is okay. We can start, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the short presentation, the short introduction. You already read this on the web uh, page, on the landing page. And then we can go to the next slide. I will, so I will give you a short overview of all the administrative steps you have to take. And it's, it's, uh, 
it seems very dry. I will start with the legal basis of your doctoral studies and you might think, oh my goodness, what is this? Um, but it's very important because Luxembourg has a very strict law um, for, for, for the university and included in this law are some uh, really strict rules about you, about the doctoral candidates. Among uh, others, uh, it's the the time of your 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 studies, which is defined in the law. It's uh, so you should maybe take the time to read these articles. The the bad thing is it's only available in French, so uh, you would need to have some reading uh, cap capabilities in French. Uh, the study regulations they define more in general the rules of the law and we have uh, we have made a, a very um, we always call it a pirate uh, translation of the of this uh, chapter from the study regulations in um, into english so you can uh, look at this in on our moodle page which i will explain to you later so the study regulations they really talk about uh, details about the, the your eligibility, the ECTS requirements, how the thesis supervision committee is organized, how your jury is organized and, and all these things. It sounds really dry, but it's, it's a basis and it's also there to protect you and to help you and to make it very clear what you have to do, but also what the supervisor has to do and what you don't have to do. So it's, um, not too bad to have a look at this. Then the last point, I really uh, want to make a, a note on this. There might be special requirements in your doctoral program. Every one of you is enrolled in the doctoral program. This is also new uh, in the new law, uh, the law from 2018. And these doctoral programs, they might have um, additional requirements, which we in, in, in our office, we, we know, but we cannot really explain it to you. So it's much better to go to the doctoral program for things which might be in addition to the law and the study regulations. They can never be in contradiction to what is written in the law. And if you have the feeling that this is the case, just talk to us. These things we can sort out very easily. Okay, we can quickly go to the next slide. Thank you. There is a chronology. Actually, it's also behind me here in my office. It's, it's a kind of our Bible. We, uh, we use this uh, graph to show you a little bit um, what, what, what will happen during the three or four years you are here with us. So what I said, you have to be here from a legal point of view between 36 months and 48 months. This is the law. And you, you already did the before step. So you're here, you have a supervisor, you have maybe a work contract or, or not. Uh, the first year seems to be very busy because you have to do the nomination of your CET, the Comité d'Encadrement de Thèse, the Thesis Supervision Committee. And then you also have to do the, you, you should sign a doctoral education agreement. I will talk about these things later. And then you see that each year you do a meeting with your CET. Um, this is also obligatory. This is written in the law. And you should insist on this. You can, of course, and that's what, what the panelists said before, uh, you can, of course, meet them more often or you can have additional meetings or day-to-day -day exchanges, no problem. But once a year, we ask the CET to uh, have this, to, to meet with you in person, to sign, uh, to write and to sign a report and you will also sign this report. So you, we have a formal uh, a formal step each year and then during these years you also collect your ECTS points. I will talk about this later. The last year, I mean here it, on the scale it looks as the fourth year, it can also be the third year, it depends on your progress and how quick you are. Uh, so the last year is also very important and kind of busy because you have to write your thesis, you have to submit a Project the test, uh, kind of 90% thesis, 
for the last CT meeting, you have to do a plagiarism check. That means you have, we will give you access to a software which uh, you will need to use to show that you didn't copy too much. Um, then you, uh, you will get your defense authorization and at the latest, on the last day of the four years, eight months, you have to submit your thesis, your written 100% thesis. Um, and then, of course, you do your PhD defense. This is a, also this is the final and uh, yeah most uh, important event, I guess, at the end of your studies. And if we don't have a COVID crisis, normally this is also a very nice event to invite friends, family, fellow students, others to your defense, because the defense normally is a public event where everyone can join. Unless you, you treat a, a very, very specific subject, which is, uh, which is uh, sub subject to um, yeah, confidentiality. Okay. Then we normally also have a diploma ceremony, but regretfully not this year because of the virus. And you will, of course, be asked to give feedback. So this is very short, the, the life cycle here at our university. And maybe we can go to the next slide. So I will talk a little bit more about uh, all the documents and uh, especially doctoral education agreement, which is a new thing. So the Comité d'encadrement de thèse has to be nominated at the latest two months after the start of your study. You should nominate this or you should come up with names together with your supervisor. This should really be a, a group which, which suits everyone. And the vice rector nominates this uh, committee. And uh, of course, during your study, what was said before, things can change and you can also change your committee. That's, this is all possible. In the next, well, ideally up to six months after the start of your studies, you should have uh, signed the doctoral education agreement. This is a very, very new uh, document we just put in place. It's also a requirement of our new law. So this is a kind of contract uh, to be signed by you, by your supervisor, by the members of your, your uh, supervision committee and the, uh, the coordinator of your doctoral program. And it lays down uh, your rights and duties, the rights and duties of the supervisors, of the CT members. And what is very important, it has um, also a detailed section on what you do in case of disagreements. I mean, you're, you're now starting your PhD, you're in the first year, um, and maybe, uh, could you go back with the slide? Sorry. Thank you. Um, you, you, you may be, um, you, oops, what's happening? <laughs> uh, okay, we wait for the slide to come back, thank you. Uh, so maybe you cannot imagine that things go wrong, but as the panelists very nicely explained before, there might be moments where you need help. And it's very important, and I'm really glad that this was all mentioned by the, by the more advanced uh, doctoral candidates. There is help available. And you will see in the doctoral education agreement, there is a section and we tell you whom to contact. And one of these uh, points of contact is the famous ombudsperson, which was mentioned before. Um, the university is about to recruit such an ombudsperson. It's not there regretfully for the moment, but there are other pe persons you can talk to. There is one doctoral school, the doctoral school in uh, science and uh, engineering. They have already an ombuds committee in, in place and it's working very well. So uh, this is a nice development. And I think with the ombuds person coming, we will have another very important point of contact where you can go to and do it right away. Don't wait for the last year, if you have problems, just talk about it. It's, it's, it's fine. It, there are always, yeah, there is always a way to, to get out of, of, a, of a bad situation, but you have to talk about it. 
Um, then what I said, each year we have a CT report which will be written. Uh, it's obligatory and you normally the CT report is written together also with all the CT members and you will see the document uh, afterwards and you will acknowledge receipt. So this is very important that everyone says that he or she is, is fine with the report. And finally, we have a thesis report, but this is at the very end of your, your studies. There, there are more documents to fill, but the thesis report is something which will be uh, written after the defense and you will receive it as a part of the diploma supplement. And it's a very nice, I would say, a final statement of what you achieved with your thesis and why you deserve to be a doctor, a PhD. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, this is about ECTS. Yes, it's also now quite new that you have to collect ECTS uh, credit points during your doctoral studies. You have to collect 20 in total and the minimum of five has to have to be collected in the famous transferable skills, which have nicely been mentioned before by the panelists and I'm really glad. And uh, yes, my, my um, my advice would have been to go to the to the stand during the the afternoon uh, scavenger hunt, but regretfully it will not take place today. But as Baija said, it will take place later this year in an online uh, format, so you will receive there all you need to know from the transferable skills from my colleague Anne, who's listening as well, and um, it's really our our vice rector always calls them essential skills, no? not transferable skills, but essential because they are essential to your development. It might, it might be, it might look at the first place, you might ask, yeah, but why do I need to do a project management or good scientific practice? I, I, I know this. No, it's just added value. So, uh, in the doctoral education agreement, you will have a research and training plan, which will detail, lay down in detail how many uh, courses and what courses you, you plan to take. Of course, this you cannot say now in the first year what you plan to do in the third or fourth year. It's flexible, but you should have an idea. Um, you can take the courses here from our central uh, transferable skills offer. Also, the doctoral schools offer trainings. They now also store, start to do some transferable skills offers. For example, the ethics, the good scientific practice is sometimes uh, organized um, on a dis in a disciplinary way, which makes sense. You can also go outside and collect ECTS elsewhere, but be aware they must be validated here in your doctoral program. So you can come back with a certificate which says that you did five ECTS, but then maybe after our internal checks, it's only valid one ECTS. I, su I suggest you talk to um, the supervisor before you go and collect these points. And if you are in a, in a joint supervision, a could you tell, or if you work with industry, if you're in a public-private partnership somehow, or if you work, if you have a job, uh, full-time job or something, these credit points can be uh, recognized. So, but, but this is all in, done inside the doctoral school. So uh, I suggest that you have these discussions with your supervisor and with the doctoral uh, program coordinator. So, um, yes, we can go to the next slide. Uh, just to sum up, who can help you during your studies? This, of course, is my office, the Office of Doctoral Studies. And uh, if you, uh, if you uh, were present at one of our virtual welcome sessions, you met my colleagues. Uh, I have four colleagues in the Office of Doctoral Studies. Uh, Cheyenne, Celine, uh, Cecilia and Jessica. And then, of course, there is Anne Begay, who's doing the transferable skills, uh, who can be contacted via another email address. So you can contact us via this email address, phdstudies at uni.lu, and there will always be someone replying to you. We uh, created a Moodle page 
uh, where you can self-enroll. This page doesn't look very nice at the moment, but we're working on it. And there's also a new software where you can uh, take appointments. Then each doctoral school has a secretariat with a dedicated email address and you should contact them regularly. Probably you've done this already. So they are also very valid contact points. Okay, I think I said everything which I wanted to say. There is a final slide um, where we can go to. So your final stop will be the graduation. And here I put a photo of last year's graduation. So this is how it normally takes place in December. All or a lot of doctoral candidates come, they bring their families, we have a keynote speaker, we have a reception afterwards. And it's really, it's really a very, very nice event. And I, I really hope when you, new ones, you come to this point, we will not have Corona anymore and no virus uh, forbidding us to do this. So this uh, graduation will happen, as I said before, 36 to 48 months after your start of, the start of your studies. The thesis has to be submitted six weeks before the defense date to the jury, the, the examination panel. And Yes, the latest day to do so is the end of the month, 48. Then you have, it can take longer. You still have four months to prepare your defense. This is also a new uh, element in the law, um, but you, you also can do it earlier. This is uh, just a final requirement. Okay, so I think I used my 15 minutes. Uh, I thank you very much. If you have questions, Drop us an email at phdstudies uh, at uni.lu or you can also write your, your um, questions in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. Could you just go back to the previous slide? Yes. So this is the email address phdstudies at uni.lu where you could drop your questions. And if you have many or other questions concerning your PhD life cycle, you could send them to this address email. Thank you and very much, Anya. Yes? I think we also share the slides, do we? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. We will do that. Thank you very much, Anya. You're welcome. Thank you. So now it's time to talk about this afternoon game. So as you, as you know, we had to change it. Uh, it will not be here on the Belleval campus, but it will be behind your screens. So um, we will have an ultimate quiz show. All the game registrants will receive an email with a Zoom link, and you just have to follow the instructions. The game will start at three, and we will see who will be the master of this ultimate quiz show. Before closing this uh, morning event, I would like to thank all the partners for their contribution to the success of the event. And I would like to thank you, you, the attendees, for sticking, sticking with us, even with all those technical troubles. So thank you very much and stay tuned because um, we have a really nice making of video for you. So enjoy. If something goes wrong and something will go wrong, my name is Thomas Castinius. I'm the CEO for LIST, the Luxembourg Institute of Social Economics. <laughs> Let's go. So, I can't do that. But also university, blah, 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 and everything is fair. Exactly. <laughs>